Providing Needs-Based Care, narrated by Lisa Shiver. The World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. This does not mean that there is necessarily an absence of disease. As we'll talk about in a minute, different people consider their self healthy, although they still may have disease present. The World Health Organization also states that health is the fundamental right of every human being. The meaning of health. Health exists when the individual's needs are satisfied and a homeostasis or balance is achieved. Now this again is going to vary among individuals. What one person may consider healthy, another may consider unhealthy. Illness is defined as a deviation from the normal healthy state. Illness is a state in which results when an individual is not effectively adapting to stimuli and cannot satisfy needs or achieve that homeostasis or balance. On a continuum, health and illness may be viewed as phases of coping ability. And that's something we need to keep in mind as nurses as well. Different patients are going to respond differently to illness. Factors that can cause illness may be predisposing, such as genetics, meaning it's something you were born with or you have, you've gotten from your parents. It may be a contributing factor or a condition that's favorable for a disease. Maybe you have a lot of risk factors present. Or is it a precipitating factor or condition that activates disease rapidly? For example, if you're a smoker, you increase the risk for lung cancer. So that's a precipitating factor. The stages of coping with disease include denial, which we may see fear, anxiety, or irritability from the patient. There's a stage of acceptance, where the patient wants care done quickly and efficiently. And then there's a stage of recovery, where the patient is usually calm and cooperative. Keep in mind that illness impacts individuals' behavior, their emotions, their body image, self-concept, family roles, and also the family dynamic. So illness is going to impact everything. In our emotional response to illness, the patient may experience fear, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, anger, hostility, self-pity, over-dependence, and helplessness. To promote adaptation to illness, as the nurse, we should allow patients to speak fairly without being judgmental. Let them express their feelings. We need to encourage self-help groups if they're available, help promote their self-esteem and their self-worth, and also provide resources to cope with their illness. There are three levels of prevention I want to mention in promoting wellness and health. The first being primary prevention. This is the level where we're doing preventative medicine, we're giving immunizations, we're focusing on physical and nutritional fitness, um, education could fall under primary prevention. We're trying to prevent illness from occurring. Well, secondary prevention, this is where we see a lot of the screening procedures. For example, I've got listed up there the PSA or the prostate uh, blood test for males over the age of 50. You could also include um, or doing mammograms for females to screen for breast cancer or uh, pap smears. Those would all be screening uh, procedures for higher risk populations. Then we have tertiary prevention. This is where we educate for those with disease or disability. An example given there, maybe we have a diabetic patient that needs more education concerning foot care. They already have diabetes, they already have an illness, but what we're providing is more education related to the care of that disease or disability. Erickson has developed eight predetermined life stages. Based on these eight life stages, this determines your psychological development and also all stages affect later stages in life. For example, on this page I've got 
the eight stages listed. And of course, when we're born, we're all going to start in infancy. But the stage of development will be trust versus mistrust. And we'll be developing our attachment versus bonding relationships. Well, once we complete the infancy stage, we move on to early childhood. Each stage builds on the previous stages. And we can't move on until we've adequately um, completed the previous stage of development. So we have eight predetermined life stages. Harmony is achieved with a balance of all characteristics. And we can use these eight stages for the structure of understanding human development. I'm not going to go into great detail about all of these stages, but we do need to look back over these and really study the developmental stages. The humanistic theory was developed by Maslow and he created the Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. He said that personality and motivation is based on this hierarchy of needs and you've got to meet the lower needs first before moving on to the higher needs. And this is very, very useful in prioritizing nursing care. I'm going to show you an example here. On the bottom level of our hierarchy, we have the physiological needs. And these include things like oxygen, food, water, um, elimination, rest, things we have to have to survive. Safety includes needs such as security, protection, stability, and order. With love, we see belonging, affiliation, we see relationships develop. Esteem is related to the self-esteem or competency, achievement, you have esteem for others. Self-actualization or the, up, the highest level. This is where you're becoming capable or you're becoming everything one is capable of, okay? So before we can get to the self-actualization, we have to meet the physiological needs first and then the safety and then the love, esteem, and self-actualization. So it has to go in that order. If you're ever taking a nursing test and you're trying to figure out what would be the patient's priority, well, you need to look at the physiological needs first. We need to meet those before we can worry about those that are higher up on the hierarchy of needs. With the physiological, again, we're talking about oxygen, nutrition, elimination, activity, the safety, freedom from danger, mechanical, thermal, bacterial, chemical, or pain. With the belongingness or love, this includes affection, companionship, and our relationships. Self-esteem includes self-awareness, your body image, and your self-concept. And then lastly, self-actualization includes your personal growth, your maturity, your awareness of potential, and your learning. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about cultural variations. Your cultural culture is defined as your way of life. This is a learned pattern of behavior that you learn from those that you were around when you were growing up. And usually we think about our parents. This shapes your thinking and serves as the basis for your social, religious, and family structure. It also helps provide that framework for who we are and who we've become. It helps structure your ideas, your beliefs, and your values. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But keep in mind there can be subcultures as well. For example, we live in the United States, so we are Americans, but a subculture of that may be folks that live in Alabama. Consider this. Is it possible that one culture may view behaviors as mental illness that another might view as normal for a culture? And we'll skip down to the bottom. What would happen if you were to go to India and order a hamburger. Well, if you did that here in Opelika, nobody would think anything different. But in India, you might be viewed as having a mental illness. Our care as nurses must be congruent with cultural beliefs, values, and practices. Defiance from a predominant cultural expectation could be mistaken for a mental illness when it's actually not a mental illness. It's just they're following their cultural belief. So as nurses, we have to be really sensitive to 
differences in culture and try to accommodate that as much as possible. With the Western culture, this is the basis for American nursing. Um, it is based on the personality and developmental theories of Freud and Erickson and Maslow. It's also based on the Greek, Roman, Judeo-Christian thought. In the Western culture, we tend to focus on being successful and being independent, and we're always looking towards the future. With Eastern culture, it is based on the thought of Chinese and Indian philosophers and spiritual tradition, traditions of Confucius and Buddha and Taoism. With the Eastern culture, we tend to see the focus is more on the family and making group decisions and not as much independent as it is in the Western culture. There's also a strong focus on the yin and yang energy, positive and negative energies. With Native Americans and African cultures, they are generally based on connection to the natural world and our tribe. And again, we see a lot of family and group connections with the Native Americans and African cultures. And also there's a strong tie with the earth, with the Native Americans. So you see all three little bit different beliefs in the cultures, and we just need to learn to be um, open to patients that have cultures that are a little bit different than our own. Values are abstract standards which represent an ideal. They're usually based on your culture or culturally oriented, and there's no right or wrong for anybody. This tend to change over time, and values are something that you choose for yourself. For example, your values related to freedom or your thoughts related to abortion, religion, drug use, money, politics. You probably have some strong feelings about each one of those, but those are probably views that have changed as you have grown. And a lot of them may be culturally oriented as well. Nurses must be sensitive and accepting to the unique and different values and beliefs of others. Ethnic traits, I just want to mention briefly. These are values, traditions, customs, and cultural habits. Very important in preserving our culture. And they also provide established guidelines for living. They help establish one's point of view. Religion is a defined, organized, and practiced system of worship. Your values range from those that allow for individual variation to those on the other end that require a commitment to place the religion before your family, work, or even friends. So our religious values are going to vary. Stereotyping is defined as oversimplifying the mental picture of a cultural group. This is when you assume that all members of a certain group behave in a certain manner. For an example, uh, if you have a client that is from Iraq of Muslim faith, you cannot assume that they're a terrorist. Have there been terrorists from Iraq of Muslim faith? Yes. Are all people from Iraq of Muslim faith terrorists? No. So if you assume, assume that everybody is, then you are stereotyping um, that population. Prejudice is defined as an extreme form of negative stereotyping and a form of prejudice is actually racism. This form of prejudice occurs through the exercise of power against those who are judged to be inferior and this is where the folks that are judged to be inferior are actually limited or not able to do something because they're judged to be inferior. And this isn't just ethnic, uh, based on ethnic backgrounds. We also see racism that's actually gender-based. For a cultural assessment component, we have to consider our communication. Uh, different cultural backgrounds have different preferences related to maybe their nonverbal communication or making eye contact. In certain cultures, it's not appropriate to make eye contact. Or in certain cultures, it's not appropriate to touch. Um, there are certain gestures that may be appropriate in one culture that are not appropriate in another. So we just need to be aware of the different cultural variances. Also interpreters, 
may be needed to help if you have a non-English speaking patient. Ideally, you would not want a patient's family member to be an interpreter because that can cause some issues. What if that family member is not aware of what has been going on with the patient? So it could cause some barriers to care. So ideally, you wouldn't have a family member, but sometimes we don't have a choice. We need to consider also the space, spatial, spatial relationships for certain cultures. Uh, in some cultures, it's appropriate to stand very close to someone when communicating, and then in other cultures, it's not. Also, we need to consider the social organization. Who's the decision maker, or who makes decisions for the family? What's the dynamic of the family? In some cultures, the male or the head of the household makes all decisions for all family members. So if that's the case, we just need to be aware of that. Also, we need to consider what's their time emphasis. In the Western culture, we tend to fo focus on the future. Um, in the past, dealing with the Hispanic population, for example, they're not as conscientious as far as the future, but they're more present oriented. Biological variations may occur, and what this means is we might see different um, different illnesses or different biological variations occur among different cultural backgrounds. And then also religion. Regardless of the cultural background, values, and beliefs, we need to treat all patients with respect. Honor their rituals and beliefs unless it is detrimental to the treatment plan. And what I mean by that, if a patient wants to bring in a certain type of food, maybe it's a food that he eats routinely on a daily basis, but it's not necessarily what we would say is our norm. As long as it is not detrimental to the treatment plan of that patient, we need to honor their rituals and their beliefs unless it's going to in interfere with their treatment. For your independent review, I want you to review Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Make sure you've got a good understanding of Erickson's stages of development. Also look over the grieving process. And look at cultural and behavioral variances. In most textbooks, you can find a table that goes over the different variances depending on the cultural de demographic as far as um, communication, making eye contact, touch things of that nature.